pray that you would bless the preaching of thy word. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. And if you have your Bible and you want to look at the text this morning, it will be found in Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 5. And this morning, the title of this message is The Bread from Heaven. The Bread from Heaven. We'll be looking at one of the great miracles in the Bible when God supplied bread for the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse 2. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat which we when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. If somebody were to ask the question to many of you this morning, has there ever been a time when you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Most of you would answer emphatically, yes, I am a Christian. Some people may say, I did it once, but I need to do it again. Some people have a, a misunderstanding of words that we use at times. We talk about receiving the Lord Jesus as your Savior as the initial salvation experience. And so when I use that term, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, many times what I mean is, have you been born again? Have you repented of your sins? Has there been a time when you realized that you were a sinner, condemned sinner, and that you trusted Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross and you've turned away from your sinful lifestyle and you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and now you live for Christ. And I use it in the term as Jesus or the Apostle John used it. He said he came, Jesus came into his own and uh, many received him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. And so I would ask you, have you received Jesus as your Savior? And many of you can say, yes I have. I remember a day. I remember a time. I remember where I was. I remember what station in my life I was at. You can tell the whole story. You can give a personal testimony of when you accepted Christ. But I want to ask that question kind of in a different way this morning. I want to ask you this morning, have you received Jesus Christ today? Did you receive Jesus Christ yesterday? Do you receive Jesus Christ on a daily basis? You see, sometimes as true believers, we fall out of fellowship with Jesus. Uh, we know that we're saved. We've become a Christian. We ask him to forgive us of our sin. But somehow we grow cold and indifferent in our walk with Christ. We stray away spiritually. There's a distance in our heart between us and Jesus. And we no longer receive Jesus in communion and in fellowship on a daily basis. And this morning what I want to say is believers maintain their spiritual life and vitality by daily receiving Jesus Christ. And so in context, I want to talk about is daily receiving Jesus. And so here what we have, we have the children of Israel, they're on their wilderness journey. We know the story, they were set free because of the Passover lamb, Pharaoh chased them to the Red Sea. Moses miraculously through the power of God, the Red Sea split open and the children of Israel came across and now they're out in the wilderness and they last week they were thirsty and God gave them water and today they're hungry. They don't have any bread. 
And what do they do? They continue their grumbling toward Moses. And Moses prays to God and God miraculously provides bread from heaven. Now, I want to talk about this bread from heaven and I want you to see how this bread from heaven is symbolic to the Lord Jesus Christ and how that by receiving this bread, they give us a lesson on how we can receive Jesus on a daily basis. There's only three little basic points I want to make about this. Number one, manna tells us of God's gracious provision. The manna tells us of God's gracious provision. Did you ever stop to think about this manna? This manna is miracle bread. There's no natural phenomenon to explain this manna. This bread came down from heaven. In the Gospel of John, Jesus fed the 5,000 with the two, uh, five loaves and two fish. And in John chapter 6, he begins to uh, talk to them about it, and they want a sign. Now, I would think if somebody could feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two little sardines, I would say this man has got miraculous power. But as soon as Jesus fed them, they came to him, this religious crowd, and they said, well, now Moses fed us all with bread from the heaven. You need to give us a sign. And in John chapter 6, verse 30, Jesus said to them, what then do you, or what then do you do for a sign? So that, or they said, so what do you do for a sign that we may believe in you? What work do you perform? And they said, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say unto you, listen, it was not Moses who gave you the bread out of heaven, but it was my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. You see, Jesus changed the, the phrase there. Moses didn't give, but my father gives. He's trying to get them to see that I, Jesus, Jesus is the bread of heaven. He wanted to clear up a misconception, and that was, it was not Moses, but it was God who gave them this manna. He goes on to say in verse 33, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, Lord, give us this bread. And listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus tells his followers, I am the living bread that come down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. So you see the correlation between that earthly manna that fell to feed their physical body and what Jesus is saying there. He's saying, I am spiritual food. And if you take me in, you will live forever. Manna was physical bread, gave life to their bodies. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's gracious provision. It is spiritual bread that gives life to our souls. Now this manna was like Christ in that it was a gracious provision. Did you notice what it said in Exodus, the, the first verse I read? It said the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now I want you to understand something. The children of Israel, when they received this manna, were not behaving themselves very nicely. They were acting like Southern Baptists. It's amazing how God gives grace to grumbling, complaining, unbelieving people. It's wonderful that Jesus Christ saves us and cleanses us and it's not because we clean ourselves up good enough for him to receive us. Listen, it don't matter to me and it doesn't matter to God how bad you have been or how low you have sunk. Listen, you may be a gutter drunk, you may be a prostitute, you may be a rich businessman who's cheating people all over the country, you may be like the prodigal son who's wallowing in the hog pen, but it makes no difference because Jesus said, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. The Bible says, listen to the Bible. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us while we're sinners. 
Not after we stop sinning. Do you see that? It's God's gracious provision. This bread of heaven is God's gracious provision. Jesus comes to us while we're sinners to save us. I want you to see something about this gracious provision. This manna is solitary bread. It's solitary bread. Without the bread of heaven, these people are going to perish. Did you, did you see that? They're standing around looking at each other. They have no meat. They have no sustenance. They have no grain. They have nothing. They have no food. There's not a McDonald's. There's not a, there's not a, 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 a there's, there's not a Cracker Barrel. There's nothing. And they're standing around looking at each other. Moses, what are we going to eat? And Moses said, God will provide bread in the morning. And this is the only thing they had. You eat the bread or you die. Folks, I'm here to tell you something. Jesus Christ is the only hope for a sinner to be saved. There is no other way. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men whereby we must be saved. Solitary bread. How foolish it would have been for those starving Israelites to stand around out there in that wilderness and discuss this manna. I'm glad none of them were college professors and philosophers. Can you hear them standing there having this intellectual discussion as this bread fell out of the heaven? One of them would have stood there and said, well, there's really not any bread here. You're just so hungry, you think you see bread. It's not, not any really bread out here. And somebody else would say, well, there's bread, but there couldn't have come from God. There's got to be a scientific explanation for this. Probably what it is, it's, it came out of some sort of flower. You know, I, I read some people who tried to explain it. said some trees had some gum that came out of it, and that's what it was. And somebody else said it was bird poop. Uh, well, that's what they said. But now I want to ask you something. If you read the text, you know what the text says? The text says that they had plenty of bread Sunday through Friday. And somehow those birds held it till, till, till it's a Sunday morning. <laughs> you see how ridiculous that is. <laughs> Beloved, this is miracle bread. This is wonder bread. <laughs> it's supernatural bread. It's grace bread. And I can't explain this bread and neither can you. Don't try to analyze it, just eat it. There's nothing else. There's no other way. Jesus is the bread who comes down and gives life and there is no other way. Receive him by grace through faith and be saved. Oh, beloved, it's solitary bread, but I want you to hear me. It's satisfying bread. The man has satisfied their physical needs and Jesus satisfies our spiritual needs. Jesus said, I am the bread of life and he who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. Have you ever stopped to think about how the television culture has created cravings in our hearts? I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that I've seen on television and once I saw it demonstrated, I said to myself, you know, I'd like to have one of them. But if I'd have never saw it on television, I would have never even dreamed of such a thing. But after I see it, I want it. Amen? Listen, there used to be a guy who was an expert at making you want something. He could sell snowballs to an Eskimo. Y'all remember this guy? Hi, Billy Mays here. I'm telling you, he sold more uh, OxyClean than Carter got liver pills. I'm here to tell you now, he was a salesman. And the way you sell this, this stuff is, is, is you've got to create a desire in people's minds and hearts. We got stuff. We got stuff. We have so much stuff that we have to have yard sales, garage sales, and we sell our old stuff so that we can make room for our new stuff. 
And the result of all this consumerism is it has created a culture of people who crave the latest thing. I don't want you to say amen or me. But I'll tell you what, some of y'all spent hours this week downloading a new phone operating system. Don't that look silly? We're doing it all the time. The false promise behind all of this materialism is this. You buy this product, you get this latest thing, and you'll be satisfied. The latest toothpaste. I ask you, beloved, how many times can toothpaste be new and improved? Our teeth ought to be neon. The latest soap. Ha, ha, ha. You see these guys, how happy they are in the shower? They're just singing and carrying on. Get a BMW. Your life will be satisfied. Get a new house. Get a new boat. Get a new job. Get a new husband, a new wife. Get a new something. Chasing the wind, trying to find something or somebody to satisfy our fleshly cravings. Beloved, your flesh cannot be satisfied. I'm here to tell you what you ought to do with your flesh. Your flesh ought to die with Christ on the cross. And like the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the only cure for your flesh. Jesus is God's gracious provision to satisfy the longings in our souls. Jesus is solitary bread. There is no other. Jesus is satisfactory bread. And you must receive him just like this manna had to be eaten, ingested, swallowed, taken into the innermost parts of their body. And once they did, it satisfied the cravings of their souls. Jesus said in John 6, 54, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. My question to you this morning, are you hungry? I'm going to tell you something, man, when I get hungry, when I get hungry, there ain't nothing that smells better than good old biscuits. <sighs> Cornbread. Y'all must have ate a good breakfast. I don't know. Uh, homemade rolls. How about that bacon in the stove? They tell me that if you'll cook bread, if you're trying to sell a house, and you cook bread and leave that smell in there when the buyers come, they're ten times more likely to buy it. I tell you what, if I'm hungry and you got some homemade biscuits sitting there with a big old glass of milk and some good old fresh butter, it'd make my tongue want to slap my eyeballs out. I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The question is, what are you hungry for? A lot of you are hungry and you don't know what it is you want. I'm here to tell you, you want bread from heaven. Jesus is solitary bread and Jesus is satisfying bread. But I want you to see another lesson this man teaches this morning. Not only does it teach us that is God's gracious provision. But manna teaches us that there is a gathering priority. Well, what do you mean by that gathering priority? Did you notice the text I read in verse 4? It said, the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Every day they had to gather some manna. This daily gathering of bread was a task designed to teach. Now, what does daily gathering of bread teach? The daily gathering of the manna taught them that they needed to receive the manna every day. Beloved, we need to receive Jesus Christ every single day. You see, this gathering priority, te I mean, this gathering priority teaches us the importance of a daily devotion. 
A daily quiet time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 21, it says, They gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat, and when the sun grew hot, it would melt. They had to get out there and get it before it disappeared. You see, they couldn't lollygag around like my daddy used to say. They couldn't procrastinate. They, had, they, they, they wanted to eat that day. They had to get up and they had to go out and they had to feed themselves with the manna. They had to get it every morning. They had to get it before it melted. I don't know how else to explain this. I'm going to tell a little story here, but I want to give it a little disclaimer. Boys and girls, I'm going to tell you something. There's a point to this, but now don't do this because it's wrong, okay? Now, I got your attention. That's what I intended to do. When I was in the fourth grade, we had a bully in our school. Bullying problem. It's a serious problem. I don't mean to make light of bullying. It's terrible. But we had a bully on our school bus. He was taller than everybody else. And he, and he, had, he had teeth that stuck out. We call that buck teeth. And he was a head taller than everybody on the school bus. And his teeth stuck out and they, they, I'm, they were green. And his last name was Osborne. And so we nicknamed him Osborne Green. <laughs> and this bully used to sneak up behind you on the school bus and he would take them teeth of his and he was taller than you and he'd stick them out like that and chomp you in the head. <laughs> Kids are crazy. And he'd do that. It hurt. Let tears come to your eyes. Everybody wanted to do something about Osborne Green. We didn't know what to do about him. Well, there was this one old boy. His name was Mike Davis. Mike Davis was littler than most people. And Osborne chopped him in the head about four times. And Mike Davis made up his mind he wasn't going to put up with Osborne Green. Now, boys and girls, this is the part I don't recommend. But you see, back then, we didn't know about bullying. We didn't know what you should do. You ought to go tell the teachers. You ought to tell your parents. You ought to tell an adult. There's ways of dealing with this. But Mike Davis hadn't heard about that. And so he made up his mind. He wasn't going to get bullied by Osborne Green anymore. So every time he saw Osborne Green coming, he just hauled off and clocked him a good one. Well, old Osborne would jump on him and beat the living daylights out of him. But he didn't care. Every time he saw him, wham, right in the jaw. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened after about four times of getting clocked in the jaw. Osborne Green started taking a different route. You say, what's the point? The point is this. If you have a daily time with the Lord Jesus Christ every morning eating the bread from heaven and feasting on the Word of God, you can get up every day and you can rear back and you can clock the devil right in the jaw and it won't be long before he'll start taking another route. See, some, sometimes I just see God's people just getting beat up and kicked around and pushed around. And you, are, are, are you having a daily crisis? No, no. You better eat your manna. You better eat your manna. Many of us read God's Word today. Listen. Many of us read God's Word today like it's a math book when we ought to be reading it like it's a love story. Beloved, can I say lovingly but emphatically, you need to meet with Jesus Christ every day. You need to have a daily quiet time where you pray and read God's word and get your daily marching orders from the word of God. Get a ration of manna so that you can sustain your spiritual life throughout the day. The manna teaches us of a daily devotion. The second thing is, the gathering priority teaches us the importance of a fixed focus. A fixed focus. I've studied this, and I want you to see something. This manna was gathered every day, but then on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. And they gathered that uh, twice as much on the sixth day because on the Sabbath day, they would rest and worship. It's interesting to me that this Sabbath here in Exodus is the first time it was mentioned after the children of Israel came out of Egypt. In other words, God wanted to affix the Sabbath day to this gathering of the manna. He created a weekly 
cycle with the manna so that they daily gathered the bread of heaven and then one day a week they would stop to focus and fix their minds on the Christ, on, on God. The word Sabbath means rest. I believe that God still asks and requires and expects God's people to enjoy a weekly day of rest. Christians adopted the first day of the week simply because the Lord Jesus Christ arose on the first day of the week. The early church met on Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrection and partake of the Lord's Supper. The church continues the tradition. The manna cycle, if you will, caused the children of Israel to fix their daily, weekly, monthly, and annual focus on the bread of heaven. Do you see that? Their whole week was oriented toward the manna. Their whole week, not just their Sunday, not just their Saturday, but everything was centered around, focused on gathering this bread on a daily basis. Do you see the picture? We arise in the morning as we walk each day our weeks, our months, our seasons, and our years focus on the bread of heaven. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think happens when God's people neglect the ordained cycle of the Sabbath? What happens when God's people stop their daily quiet time, stop meeting together for corporate worship? What happens? I, I'm old enough to remember back in the day when there were laws against stores opening on Sunday. I remember that. I'm not old, but I remember that. We've come a long way in my lifetime. Sunday used to be a day when all the retail stores were closed. The only thing that was open was the police station and the hospital. But now, Sunday, Sunday is the premier shopping day of the week. There was a time when we called Sunday the Holy Sabbath. Then we started calling it the Lord's Day. It wasn't long until it went from the Holy Sabbath to the Lord's Day to people started calling it preaching. Many Christians give God a sum total of two hours a, week, a month now. They don't go to church every Sunday, they go twice a month and call themselves devoted followers of Christ. We kid ourselves. What's been the result of all this? We've witnessed at breakneck speed the ruin of Christian families. And the reason is is because so many people have crowded Christ out of their lives. Parents ruin the spiritual development of their children when they allow worldly activities to squeeze out the daily gathering of the heavenly bread and the weekly day of rest and worship. And our society is falling apart because God's people have forsaken the matter cycle. Amen. That's right. I want to ask you something. Don't, don't, don't say, but you know when I say this, if you got small children, do they come to you and say, are we going to church today? I never said that one time in 18 years growing up in my parents' house. What well, doesn't any good to say it. We went to church. We never said, are we going back to church tonight? <laughs> we never said, are we going to church on Wednesday night? It was not even a prerogative. And you know what? It would have been a waste of time for me to go to my daddy and say, Daddy, I don't like my Sunday school teacher. I don't want to go to Sunday school. He would just pull something up and smack me right good. He, he, he just going anyway, boy. Because my daddy said this, you'll learn a lot from a Sunday school teacher you don't like. You might even learn to like somebody you don't like. I'm preaching now, y'all. Just, just get with me, all right? <laughs> one lady told me one day, she said, she came up to me at the back door. Ah, she said, Brother Steve. She pulls out her offering envelope because it was between, you know, Sunday school and church. We make that distinction for some odd reason. And, you know, I used to have a song later, and he said, if all I was going to do was come to Sunday school, I wouldn't even take a bath. You know, I, I, I want the whole thing, you know. And she, she came up to me and she had her offering envelope and she wanted to give it to me before she snuck out on God, you see. 
And I, I, I believe it was a guilt offering. She was handing it to me. She wanted me to know that she put some money in before she snuck off. And she said, Brother Steve, I've got to leave today. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I said, yes, ma'am, why? She said, my son's coming today. And my bed's not made. I said, yes, ma'am, I understand. And I didn't think about it a whole lot until I started on the way home. I thought, that is the worst excuse I've ever heard for <laughs> leaving church in all of my life. Her son was 46. That's right. I'm sure one time in all those years, he saw the bed not made. We're pitiful. I'm going to tell you something. Just, just, this is a side note. This is free. If you plan on backsliding and you plan on going to watch them Redskins play on Sunday instead of coming to the Lord's house, don't tell me about it, okay? It just, it just discourages me. I, I, I'm not being in the spirit on the Lord today. I, I, I might backslide along with you and get in the flesh. That'd just be awful. You say, well, preacher, I don't see anything wrong with it. You can't see right. That's the problem. I'll tell you something. I've been pastoring over 25 years. I started when I was six. And... Uh, <laughs> The people that I've noticed that enjoy Sunday morning worship the most are those people who have feasted on the bread of heaven all week long. I'm here to tell you, I know folks that'd rather be here than the best hospital in Calvary County. Amen. Amen. I'm just kidding now, but there's a gathering priority of a daily devotion. And the gathering priority teaches us to fix our focus the gathering priority teaches us the requirement of cooperative effort, corporate effort. The bread was free, but the bread had to be gathered. Did you notice that? It was free, but you had to go out and get it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, Jesus said in the model prayer, he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, the point here is that even though grace is a gift, Listen, even though grace is a gift, our spiritual vitality and growth requires that we expend effort in cooperation with God to sustain our life. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, let me just see if I can understand it here. What do you think would happen if one of those Israelites, after about the fourth day of going out and gathering manna, says, you know what? God is so powerful, he can send bread every day. I don't know why I got to... I mean, just roll over in his hammock and just flop his tongue out and said, there it is, God, just hit it. <laughs> I, I mean, God, you know, hit me with it if you want me to grow. You say, how ridiculous is that? It is absurd. They got free bread, but they had to get out of the hammock and go outside. Beloved, you are not going to get zapped by some Holy Ghost miracle and become instantly spiritually mature. You have got to cooperate in your own feeding if God is going to make you what you need to be. I remember we had a couple of boys came to live with us. They were, they were good boys except they were just really mean. And they grew up up in the trailer parks in Nashville. And uh, they were just tough as pine knots and uh, trying to teach them a few things. Nobody ever taught them anything. They were five and seven years old, and they didn't know how to take a bath. I don't know what they had done before we came along, but I went in the bathroom one night, and the oldest one was standing there with not a stitch of clothes on, and he had a wash rag, and it was soaking wet, and he was doing this with it. <laughs> it was raining in the bathroom, and they thought that was the funniest thing. They didn't know anything. And we go in there, and, 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 and it was cold, and and the boy would be standing there and he had a towel on his back and he was just going, uh, uh, uh. And I went in there and I said, Jimmy, dry off. He said, I don't know how. And I told him how. You know what he said to me? It's too hard. I said, well, freeze. <laughs> Yeah. 
1 Timothy 6.11 says, Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, perseverance, and gentleness. Romans 14.19 says, Pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Hebrews 12.14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue, pursue, pursue. Stretch yourself out in this thing of gathering the manna. You have got to cooperate with God or you will starve to death. And then finally, this gathering priority teaches us the importance of congregational fellowship. In Exodus 16, verse 16 and 18, it says there that uh, this is what the Lord has commanded, gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an homer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some gathered little. And when they measured it with a homer, he who gathered much had no access, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Here's what they did. Every day while the manna was out there, every person in the camp went out and gathered manna. They took what manna they had, say somebody over here gathered a whole bunch and somebody over here couldn't gather very much and they all piled it in a big old pile and then everybody got the same amount. You, you, you see what's going on here? This is, this is Christian fellowship. Suppose for a moment uh, one of these people had a sore leg or, or a broke toe or something and they couldn't gather very much but you had this big strong strapping guy over there and he could just scoop up it by the bucket fulls. Well now one person wasn't allowed to say I got my manna, I quit. I'm taking my little manna and I'm going home. Y'all fend for yourself. Here's the point, beloved. While the bread was out there everybody gathered bread. Everybody, every man, woman, boy, and girl, every child, everybody that could pick up manna was picking up manna. And they picked up manna until it was time to quit picking up manna. What God was doing here was God was trying to teach them to become a unified nation. Previously, they had been slaves. Previously, they eat what they could grub and what they could grab, and they, they, they serve themselves but God wants them to become a unified army because one day he's going to use them to fight his enemies. They cannot go to war against God's enemies. They must become cohesive. They must become unified. They must have solidarity. They will need to look out for one another. The community gathering is a perfect picture of Christian fellowship. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3, 4, talking about this incident, Paul says, they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and that rock was Christ. See, there was no special treatment. There were no people in the camp who got steak while everybody else ate bologna. You know what Moses and Aaron did when gathering time was going on? Moses and Aaron had their bucket out there and they were picking up manna right along with the lowest kid in the place the priests and the Levites gathered manna. And I see a perfect picture of the family of God here. You see, there are no special saints. We all gather manna together, and we all share the manna. God intends that his people worship together, work together, win the world together, and we cannot accomplish our mission if we're fragmented, fighting, and jealous. We need to forget all this outward stuff, these personal talents, and these worldly treasures. Oh, he can sing, or he's got money, or poor little old me, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I can't do anything. I don't have anything. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're saved, you are rich. You say, what do you mean? I, the bill collector's calling me. You got Jesus. You got Jesus. He is the pearl of great price. He is the hidden treasure. He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. And when you get Jesus, you can't get anything any better. I'm going to tell you something. For a hundred million years, in eternity, you know what we're all going to have? We're all going to have the exact same thing. We're all going to have Jesus. And so we're all equal. So let me ask you something. Are you receiving Jesus Christ in daily devotions? 
Do you receive Jesus Christ? Is He your fixed focus? Is your life focused around the manna cycle of gathering and worshiping? Are you cooperating with God in your maturity? And are you receiving Jesus through Christian fellowship, working together, serving together in the body of Christ? Do you pull your weight as a family member in the body of Christ? And then I want to make one final point very quickly. And that is the manna warns us, not only is it God's gracious provision, teaches us of our gathering priority, but the manna warns us about our grumbling propensity. It said that they grumbled to get manna. But I want to read another verse from another book and it talks about manna. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 and 5. Listen to this. They set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, quote, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now, let me give you a little bit of idea here, a couple of things worth noting. First off, this incident in Numbers 21 is not the incident that we're talking about in, in Exodus. This incident in Numbers 21 happened years later. It, 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 it happened in the wilderness. Manna, by the time Numbers 21 comes around, it's not new anymore. In fact, it was a daily occurrence. They didn't see anything miraculous about it anymore. It was mundane. It was same old. It was every day. It was common. And then thirdly, they were very, very close to Canaan in Numbers 21. As a matter of fact, if you look on the map, this Mount Hor where they were at is just on the southern tip of the Promised Land. Something else you need to know about Mount Hor, not only did they pass by it this time, but they had made several passes by the point is this. They had just won a battle. They were very close to the promised land. They could probably send spies over there and see it. And they had been wandering around in the wilderness for years eating this manna. And so now what's the problem? They're tired of the wilderness. They're tired of circling around. And all of a sudden they get within touching distance. And God makes them take a detour. I don't know about you, but I hate detours. I just despise a detour, especially when you can see right over there where you need to get. And you've got to turn around and go back the other way. I know Christians, listen to me, listen to me. In this world that we live in, it's like a wilderness. It's sometimes it's two step forward and three step back. But their biggest problem was is they had become bored with the bread of heaven. I, I, I know Christians. Listen, I'm coming in for a landing here, so don't lose me now. Listen, listen, listen. I know Christians that are bored living the Christian life. They're tired of the wilderness. They want a little excitement. They're tired of the journey. They're tired of Moses. They're bored with prayer. They're bored with Bible study. Going to church is, oh, not again. Do we have to go to church? They long for something to excite them. They long for Egypt. They long for a spark of excitement into their mundane lives. Miracle bread from heaven just doesn't do it for them anymore. Sometimes people say to me, not very often, but I've had it said to me over a few years, does your church have, and it's just a variety of things, usually it's the latest form of Christian entertainment, that does your church have, and they list something that they recently saw in a mega church, does, does your, your church do concerts? Does your church have a coffee shop? Does your church have an indoor playground? I went to so-and-so's church. They had a playground better than McDonald's. Light show, Fourth of July shows, car shows, Christian comedians, clowns. 
I recently heard of a church, now I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up, this is not preacher talk, okay? I heard of a church that on Saturday evening held dances, and when the preacher mounted his stage on Sunday morning, cheerleaders burst forth from the crowd and did flips down the aisle praising the pastor. Some people just can't be embarrassed, I guess. I don't know. But all that, sometimes I wonder, should we jazz it up around here? Could, could, could we attract more people if we just had some clowns or maybe some comedians? Some of y'all think I'm a comedian. I don't know. Somebody said one time, the problem in the church today, listen, the problem in the church today is not the menu, it's the appetite. We keep, we keep people with what we attract them with. And if we attract people with entertainment, we're going to have to keep them with better shows. And I'm inclined to take the Apostle Paul's advice. He said in 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews seek for a sign and the Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Beloved, you come to this church, that's what you're going to hear. This church preaches Jesus. This church teaches Jesus. This church worships Jesus. This church here, we eat, breathe, sleep Jesus. And if that excites you, then praise the name of Jesus. But if you need something more than Jesus, we don't have it here. One of the greatest churches in the Bible was the church at Ephesus. There's a book called the book of Ephesians. There's not one bad thing said in the book of Ephesians about the church at Ephesus. But a few years later, when you get to the book of Revelation, it's the first church on the list. And do you know what's said there by the Lord Jesus Christ about the church at Ephesus? He said, oh, you got great doctrine? You, 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 he, he commended them for many, many things. But then he said this, I have this one thing against you. You left your first love. Somehow or another, they had departed from that passion for the bread of heaven. Vance Abner, great preacher of old, said this. He said, revival is nothing more than falling in love with Jesus all over again. I like that. Gypsy Smith, another evangelist, once said, the way to start a revival is to go in your closet, draw a circle on the floor, get in that circle, kneel down, and pray until you fall in love with Jesus all over again, and the revival is over. I like old Bill Gaither. He's got that song, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, y'all know that, Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. He's the bread of life. He's the solitary bread, the satisfying bread. Let me ask you something. How many here this morning, how many here this morning do you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You've never been saved. There's a longing in your soul, an emptiness there. It's gnawing away, and you're trying to fill it with everything imaginable. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Then I want to ask this question. How many of you, listen, honestly this morning, how many of you sitting in this room, in the balcony, upstairs, back here, spiritually, you are cold and indifferent to God. You become bored with the bread of heaven. 
How long has it been? How long has it been since you enjoyed? I said enjoyed a daily quiet time with Christ. Does your life revolve around yourself, your needs, your desires, or does it belong and revolve around the Lord Jesus Christ? Who would be willing to say this morning, I need to start gathering my share of the manna. See, there's some weak folks in this church that can't gather much. Some of you strong folks need to gather for them because it's a corporate congregational effort. How many of you this morning would just say a simple thing like, I want to fall in love with Jesus again. Would you stand with me, bow your head, and close your eyes this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. We give an invitation in our church because we ask people to seriously and prayerfully consider what God would have them to do. And maybe this morning, God wants you to come to this altar and He wants you to pray. And maybe He hasn't told you why, but when you get here, He will. You just know He wants you to come this morning. You don't have to say a word to me or anybody else. You've got a burden on your heart and you want to come talk to the Lord about it. Perhaps this morning, God wants you to come for church membership. Would you pray about that? If you are not a member of this congregation and you've been baptized or you want to be baptized, would you come this morning and make that known? Maybe this morning you want to come for salvation. You're cold and empty inside. You're a sinner. And you need to be forgiven of your sins. There's only one way. God's gracious provision, the bread that came down out of heaven, it's the only bread there is, but it's satisfying bread. You need to come this morning. And then there are those here this morning, Christians, who've grown bored with the bread of heaven. He told that church at Ephesus he wanted them to remember and to repent and to redo what they used to do. That's the simple way to fall in love with Jesus all over again. I know there are some of you this morning who need to rededicate your life to Christ. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to stand down here out of the way. If you need to come, if you want to come for salvation, come to me. If you want to come for another reason, just come and kneel at this altar, and you and Jesus speak to one another. Father, in Jesus' name I pray, as I prayed this morning, God, that you'd make our Make our souls aware and our hearts and our minds aware of our hunger and our thirst. And God, primarily this morning, this message is for saved folks. That they rededicate themselves and realize that their life ought to revolve around the bread of heaven. So I pray that you speak to our hearts this morning. But God, there's those who are not saved and they know it. And I pray today would be the day of salvation. And the Holy Spirit would give them that conviction and that courage to say today, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. And so in just a few moments, we're going to begin to sing. And if God has laid it on your heart to come for any reason, don't tarry, don't delay. Step right out. Come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come all together?